Lajanov Evgeny Leonidovich, Doctor of Economics, Professor of the Russian Academy of Sciences, twice winner of the Government of the Russian Federation Prize in Science and Technology, winner of the Government of the Russian Federation Prize in Education. I would like to name my presentation today as the vector of uncertainty management. The assemblage point is the economy of 2100. The economy of 2100 is a node of multi, vector, often contradictory trends in a variety of configurations that determine the future. Let's narrow down the range of these key vectors to five. That is, the key vectors that process the assemblage point of the economy of 2100 are energy, digital technologies, cognitive effects, ecology, and social management. Well, first of all, it's energy. The basic profile that will determine the status of other activity profiles is analytical development. Today, more or less reasonable forecasts in analytics are 2050. We can make a definite forecast based on technological trends. The share of alternative analytics, I think, will increase, but it is unlikely that with all efforts it will exceed a level of 25% in the global energy balance. The increase in energy consumption indicates that in 80 years it will not be possible to cope with the energy supply of a growing population without using traditional fuel and energy resources. Moreover, in the growth trend of alternative or renewable energy, there is a desire of a number of developed countries to shift the main financial burden of the development of both conventional and new energy technologies onto the shoulders of new industrial countries. These are primarily Asian and Latin American countries. Hydrogen energy requires such financial investments that the global economy cannot yet afford in future logical maps in the foreseeable future. Therefore, my opinion is that there will be no global energy revolution by 2100. The second trend is digital technology. Digital technologies will continue to grow, and digital services will occupy up to 50% of the global economic balance. Another question is how to take them into account separately from the profiles of their application, that is, industry, science, education, and so on, or as a direct part of an industry activity. In my opinion, a number of promising digital trends, from which everyone somehow expects a new economic effect, are greatly exaggerated. These are, for example, neural networks, quantum computing and a number of others. Here is a good example of how it was with the blockchain. That is, blockchain is a useful technology, which, however, has not fundamentally changed the business model and the structure of industries. The next trend is cognitive effects. We have talked a lot about the knowledge-based economy. At the same time, Russia has so far managed to partially restore a number of mechanisms that ensure scientific and technical development and innovation at the USSR level. However, the Russian leadership has an understanding of this problem, and certain very serious efforts are being made, which are having an effect, including in the defense sector. The cognitive profile of the global economy will continue to play a leading role by 2100. Together with digital technologies, in my opinion, their share in the global economic balance will exceed 60%. However, this will also include entertainment and intellectual leisure services. Now ecology The ecological trend will continue to develop, drawing in money and people's efforts. However, as practice has already shown, the course on environmental priorities in the economy is largely politicized, even, I would say, a politicized course. The ontological decisions of a number of European countries, for example, to abandon nuclear energy, is a typical example. The withdrawal of nuclear technologies from the energy balance in countries such as Germany significantly worsens its economic situation. The situation has just begun to develop, and it will continue to deteriorate. Environmental innovations have limitations due to the lack of resources for these purposes, therefore, 
the growth of the environmental component and the costs of the global economy will slow down and stabilize in 10-15 years. The fifth trend is the management of society. Why did I single this out as a separate underlying economic trend? Because socio-political balancing, which also includes national, religious, sexual, gender and other problems of modern society, began to set the tone, that is, in fact, the tail began to wag the dog. And I hope that I have not offended anyone with such terms. The group of expenses for managing society is hidden in other networks of economic balance. This group will continue to grow. The stability of a society greatly affects its competitiveness. Now about the forecasts for the nearest world economy. The growth of the U.S. economy in the face of falling political power and internal imbalances resembles Baron Munchausen's attempt to pull himself out of the swamp by the hair. That is, the self-stimulation of the U.S. economy through the issue of the dollar and the transfer of inflation to other countries has almost disappeared. Without a major war, like the Second World War, the United States will not be able to radically change the situation. Now about China. In 2015, together with Valery Tsitkilov, a corresponding member of the Russian Academy of Sciences, director of the Institute of Market Problems of the Russian Academy of Sciences, I wrote a book Systemic Financial Instability in the Chinese Economy. In which direction is the Chinese engine of global economic development moving? The forecasts made there of a slowdown in China's economic growth and explanations of the reasons have been fully confirmed. Objective reasons lead to the fact that the slowdown in the growth of the Chinese economy will continue in the future. The success of the PRC is gradually becoming more dependent on their military and political influence in the world. And many countries do not like the growth of China's military and political influence in the world. We are now witnessing this on the example of the situation with Taiwan. There will be other such examples. But I think that by 2100, China's economy will remain the first or second in the world. Nothing good awaits the EU economy, political cataclysms are very likely, which will dramatically change the contour and the very content of this kind of union. Therefore, the European Union has no special prospects by 2100. The economies of a number of newly industrialized Asian countries should develop quite strongly, these are South Korea, Singapore, Malaysia, Indonesia and a number of other countries. I will not list them all. The future of the Russian economy by 2100 depends primarily on the establishment of economic relations within the framework of a quasi-state association based on the Union of Russia and Belarus, the Eurasian Union of the CIS and a number of other unions represented by BRICS, SCO and, possibly, new similar associations. Given that a lot depends primarily on the political will of the Russian leadership, my forecast is that Russia will have a large economy in 2100 as the basis of a more or less rigid union formation competing with the European Union. That is, the prospects, in my opinion, are favorable in 2100. Now I would like to describe some important trends in the development of the global economy. The economic development trends that determine the future demonstrate a number of contradictory and at the same time logical trends. Here are some of the most significant ones. On the one hand, the development of information technologies, which are called artificial intelligence, primarily neural networks, demonstrates a qualitative leap that, it would seem, should turn the world around. However, using such a convenient and in-demand service as neural networks leads to blocking the development of many human abilities and skills. This is especially evident in many young people who practically live in their smartphones. One of the key losses is the inability to focus for several tens of minutes on complex, for example, mathematical problems. Competencies in various types of activities are increasingly turning into the ability to run a program in a computer and the inability to multiply numbers in your mind, but neural networks are bad, at least so far, at solving complex nonlinear problems, especially in conditions of a lack of reliable information and in conditions with a large component of uncertainty in the development of events. The neural network well formulates a solution to the problem based on the local information presented databases on which its training is performed. When life often throws up problems, the answer to which you will not find on the internet. There is another aspect. For example, at one time, 
a large number of extremely intelligent and competent engineers could not save the USSR from self-destruction. Therefore, the question is difficult, who will win in the long run, who has better and more neural networks or who will be able to preserve the human intelligence of young people? In my opinion, there is no answer yet. Another logical fork is, on the one hand, a pronounced acceleration of scientific and technological progress in a number of areas, while simultaneously slowing it down in many other areas. The development of computer technology is changing our lives right before our eyes. At the same time, for example, transport technologies have changed little over the past 50 years. A good example is the military sphere. In the military sphere, much is said, for example, about weapons based on new physical principles. At the same time, for example, many American planes, bombers or tanks, in the mood of new electronics, have hulls manufactured more than 50 years ago. Hence the question of which technology will turn out to be the technology of intermediate development. Next is the development of a market economy. On the one hand, the success of market economies is postulated. On the other hand, the formation of global markets is increasingly manipulative, a kind of planned nature. For example, the cost of transporting goods abroad greatly affects the competitiveness of national companies, for example, in China, and the cost of transportation depends on the cost of fuel, which is manipulated by the infusion or outflow of funds in the markets of derivative financial instruments, for example, futures. The volume of trade in so-called paper oil is much higher than the volume of trade in real oil. That is, the management of world oil prices is largely planned in nature. Russian income from oil and gas exports against the background of the virtual arrays of Western countries' finances, taking into account derivatives and other derivative financial instruments, seem to us to be an arithmetic error. And where is the Russian affiliation of the money supply in the space of countries friendly to Russia? That is, the question is, where is the optimal boundary between the plan and the market? Another question is whether multinational corporations can be called ministries of a non-existent world government. Now Bitcoin. In the media, we have all seen a picture of the sudden appearance of an independent cryptocurrency. It would seem that there are no states or global financial structures behind it. Even the creator of Bitcoin is unknown. That is, it seems to be a vivid example of the self-organization of a new global financial instrument, an institution standing above national financial systems, in person. A little more, it would seem, some experts note, Bitcoin has become a truly global currency. However, in the process of increasing the value of Bitcoin, there was a tendency when a group of multinational banks consistently, without advertising, invested trillions of dollars in buying Bitcoin, that is, a traditional speculative scheme. Then, when the value of Bitcoin reached the top, those banks, having unleashed demand, quietly got rid of the main amounts of Bitcoins, recording profits. And the subsequent fall of Bitcoin, as always, fell on the shoulders of the last buyer standing at the end of the purchase chain, that is, behind the poster of a new financial instrument in the global financial institution of Bitcoin, there is an old scheme in a group of well-known banks. Therefore, the question is, if the Bitcoin phenomenon is someone's successful financial operation, will Bitcoin or its equivalent become a global supercurrency by the year 2600? There is no answer yet. Then we lived in a pre-industrial society, then in an industrial society, then in an information society. Now we are gradually moving into a digital society or a digital economy. In eight years we will be living in a post-digital world. What are his features? One of the most significant controversial digital trends is the implantation of devices with a significant intellectual component and access to global telecommunications networks. For example, this is an electrocardia stimulator. This is the simplest device with an intelligent component. How far will this trend go? On the one hand, it is very convenient for a person to connect to global networks using a busy neural interface. Such technologies are progressing rapidly. On the other hand, there is also a reverse effect when artificial intelligence begins to indirectly or directly control a human carrier, because many people will like it. How pleasant and convenient it is when you can, in real time, without connecting to any wired network, 
Ask the internet or some neuroprogram of artificial intelligence for a hint on various problems. That is, the trend is absolutely objective, there is no conspiracy theory, another step forward in network innovation technologies. With such a quasi-integration of the human brain and artificial intelligence services, the question arises how far the integration of the human brain and artificial intelligence will go, and whether this will be of interest to the person from 1600 or whether it is necessary to come up with a new term now, not homo sapiens, but homo digital, that is, digitized person or digital person. And is it possible to admit in advance that our grandchildren in 1600 will not have much in common with us, or will the changes not be so drastic? Another trend is that it is becoming more profitable for society in different countries to maintain a large number of unemployed dependents. The most typical example is in the USA. Everyone, I think, understands who I mean. That is, to deliberately reduce the proportion of people who work usefully in order to maintain the manageability of society. The traditional management systems of the economy and society that have developed over the past 230 years have begun to crumble in the last 10 years. Such a trend is quite likely in the next 10, 15, maybe 20 years, political and social management turned out to be more important than purely economic management. Where it can lead further by 2100, where it can lead in the USA, in Europe, in China and India, in Russia and a number of post-Soviet republics what will be the national identity, and whether they will turn into a commodity that will be traded based on bonuses from society. Another trend, over the past 10 to 15 years, it has been postulated that digital trading and financial empires will displace traditional banks and companies. However, it turned out to be very easy to put digitals in place, you just had to pull the global plug out of the global electrical outlet. That is, it would seem that the objective trend of strategic development turned out to be not so objective. Blockchain turned out to be just a tool for storing information, without fundamentally changing the economy. Artificial intelligence is responsible for your smartphone, bank, and digital operator. The essence of the money of a financial transaction does not change from this, the form of its registration changes. How radically the financial system is changing by the year 2100. Another trend, over the past few decades, manipulation of finances and their volumes, as well as borrowing conditions, has been a key factor in global competitiveness. It would seem that the role of operating with material resources has lagged behind finance forever. And suddenly, China's handling of the supply or non-delivery of some rare earth metals sets the wind whether Taiwan will be able to continue producing chips for the whole world under American patents. Therefore, the question is how much the role of some material resources will increase by 2100. Another question is whether the West and China, by analogy with the carbon tax imposed by the West, should pay Russia for the oxygen produced by its forests and breathed by our foreign colleagues. Another question, even in the post-Soviet space, there are reasons for a war for fresh water. Over the past few years, the situation in relations between Tajikistan, Kyrgyzstan and Uzbekistan has repeatedly escalated due to the fact that power plants, reservoirs were being built and the volume of fresh water moving along rivers changed dramatically. Many people don't like it, and the topic is absolutely unsolvable. Now, what will happen by 2100, when fresh water is not desalinated, there will be even less fresh water. There are many more such questions. My main conclusion is from these questions. Our next key resource in Russia is people. Let's save the people. They will become not only in history textbooks, but also in the real world. And the next part of my talk is about the key differences between the new features of the economy that will define the economy by 2100. The first feature, economic features. Profit has finally and irrevocably broken away from the cost of tangible and intangible production. The cost of real production in the total price of the total commodity mass is now to dash 4%, and therefore the main profit is no longer profit or even super profit, but hyper profit is formed in virtualized spheres. This is the sphere of manipulation of credit funds and derivative financial instruments in the form of financial pyramids over any real production. 
This is in the transactional sphere, which determines the effectiveness of those levels of management with a multiplying effect that multiplies many times with each transition from the lower to the upper level of management. And these are models of an equivalent market exchange of innovations for tangible and commodity products, both energy raw materials and medium-sized high-tech ones. The next feature, financial, is the credit. Financial and currency relations have finally lost touch with the real, commodity, gold or other filling of money. The derivative showed that the basis of credit and financial or other transactions is now not the underlying asset itself, but the image of the underlying asset, packaged in some kind of financial and instrumental shell. In the new economic pseudo-reality, it does not matter what underlies the underlying asset, whether traditional types of finance, digital finance, financial instruments, and so on. The main thing is to create a financial center with the greatest leverage. The political features of the United States are rapidly losing the potential of a global regulator. This is good and bad. Why is it good? Every day we hear from the TV why it's bad. The world needs a global regulator. The UN, which was conceived in this way, since the global regulator is now losing its influence for many objective reasons and efforts. The question is what's next, but the global regulator is not yet visible. At the same time, the range of dangerous threats in the world is constantly expanding. How are we going to cope? Russia is simpler than the rest. We have always been accustomed to rely primarily on ourselves. The structure of world politics by 2100 is not clear from the word at all. Production features. Production cycles, financial and commodity flows are now formed not by the market, but by macro, energy appeal, with the formation of an unequal commodity volume of cheap material values for other innovations. That is, global markets do not develop themselves, but are purposefully formed within the framework of the next management cycle. The first is the formation of a future macro, energy scheme for giving back the epicenter. The next thing is the investment of foreign investments. The next iteration is the formation of production complexes. The next iteration is structuring in a different location of the profit center. Next is the artificial formation of demand for products by manipulating the price of energy carriers and the resulting transport and other costs. Next, we will eat the financial cream by none equivalent exchange of the manufactured products. First of all, commodity and raw materials for expensive foreign innovations. And the last and final transaction is the transfer of a hyper, profitable business to private or public corporations in less developed countries. Organizational features, the planned corporate structure has come to the fore. The state mechanism, for example, in many countries, and not only the United States, is rapidly fading into the background. There is a substitution of real decision-making by government officials for decision-making by latent structures of a corporate oligarchic nature. The more heads of state in the world begin to play a purely representative role, politically capitalizing with more or less personal success on the needs of economic elites, national and foreign. The features are military. In the context of the systemic crisis of the world economy and politics, Many key factors consider a new world war necessary. At the same time, almost all of them hope to shift it onto the shoulders of other countries, that is, military measures to resolve economic contradictions are still relevant. The features are geostrategic. The development and implementation of strategic and operational management decisions that are proactive to the country of competitors in various geostrategic spaces has been worked out. This is the initiation of a certain format of the financial and economic crisis. This is a multi-way operation of exchange rates, oil, gold, and food prices. This is the initiation of pseudo-important programs in the world of ecology, alternative energy, and shale gas production. This is the sudden emergence of geographically isolated pandemics. However, as the sanctions applied to Russia have shown, these geostrategic mechanisms have dramatically reduced their effectiveness. We will see how this will be implemented in the near future. The features are scientific and technical. Operating in the areas of fundamental scientific research, country and corporate entertainment of strategic research and development works is playing an increasingly important role. Such tools as organizational structuring of innovation centers are used here, including the formation of scheme for generating innovations and their commercialization, 
for creating national and international innovation and technology networks, targeted concentration of financial and scientific and technical resources, control over the nature of final corporate ownership, use of software innovations, and so on. That is, all this becomes the most important, if not a determining factor of victory in geostrategic competition. Scientific and technical platforms corresponding to financial formats largely determine the well-being of states, transformational corporations and civilizational systems in general. What are you virtualizing? Everything is being virtualized, that is, all processes are being moved to an electronic, virtual and functional air-conditioned footprint in an intellectual space that becomes a new and subjective objective reality. A kind of virtual universe is being created for human intelligence. What are the limits of virtualization? Let's show the future. Well, that's about it. I don't like a lot of what I have listed from the trends of various contradictory trends. However, these are all very serious vectors of the development of the reality of which we are a part. Taking into account these features, which we have just discussed, I hope will help the audience to better understand the contours of the future global economy. Thank you.